about the lack of women in local government. Um, I interviewed Dawn Purvis, who was the heroic director of the Marie Stopes Clinic in Belfast, which was the only abortion provider. But the, sort of the trans issue or, um, just did not impinge on my consciousness at all. Which I'm telling you, really, I just think because I was quite struck by it when I look back. And when I feel frustrated nowadays, you know, you know that somebody or other um, isn't really up to speed with what I think is quite a serious erosion of uh, women's rights, you know, bearing in mind that even tonight this event wasn't announced, the venue, until two o'clock. And it's a struggle, I know, for Women's Place to get venues. Not everybody still accepts bookings from Women's Place UK. Um, I sort of have to remind myself that I was once that person who didn't uh, know what was going on, and I'm a journalist, and it's my job to know about these things. Anyway, um, the policy situation, as Helen has referred to, uh, changed um, really dramatically in 2016, when the Women in Equalities Committee under Maria Miller issued its report on transgender equality. Um, the the um, report accepted many of the arguments that had been made by trans activists in the evidence. Um, most notably, it said that self-ID should be introduced for anyone aged 16 or over. But the initial response from the government, as under David Cameron, was not that promising from a trans activist point of view. And it wasn't until 18 months later, um, so summer of 2017, <coughs> um, by which time Theresa May was the Prime Minister, that the government said that it agreed with the committee and would legislate. Uh, this was reported in the Observer, among other places. Um, Janice Turner in the Times had already been covering um, this issue um, pretty regularly for a couple of years. Um, anyway, I was working on the Guardian opinion desk by this time, and in February of the following year, uh, so that's 2018, I wrote about the subject for the first time. Labour was then having a row about whether transgender women should be eligible for all women shortlists, and I contributed to what we call a panel, which is when several writers contribute short pieces on the same topic. So in this case, there was me, Sonia Soda, the writer Sean Fay, and Shasta Aziz, who was then a Labour councillor. Uh, I don't agree with some of what I wrote then, I was still trying to figure it out, but at least I was honest when I wrote that whatever gender theory says, many of us, myself included, are struggling to keep up. Anyway, it wasn't for a few months after that until the summer of 2018 that the government finally launched its consultation on the proposal to introduce self-ID. This time the announcement was from Penny Mordaunt, and she uh, said in the House of Commons, uh, made the announcement by saying that trans women are women, trans men are men, and that's the starting point of this consultation, and it's going to be the finishing point as well. Um, <laughs> I'm, I'm paraphrasing slightly, but those were her words, pretty much, and made it sound as if the government had, had made up its mind, really, and, and prejudged what the outcome would be. Um, by that time, I'd moved to the leader's desk, where we write editorials, as a social affairs specialist, so that's where I was working during the consultation. And that's when the coverage of the issue became really prominent, um, much harder to ignore. Helen's mentioned the series that she ran in The New Statesman, in July 2018, another Helen, Helen Joyce, did something similar in The Economist. Uh, ran a two-week, uh, ten-part series built as a discussion of transgender issues, I think with five trans writers and five non-trans writers. In a note that ran along with the series, the editors, and I don't know if it was just, just Helen, it probably had colleagues involved, uh, made clear that the no-debate stance adopted by some self-ID activists had been an issue. Um, they, they added in this note that several of those we invited to contribute told us that none of these issues should even be up for discussion, which is quite striking, I think, given that this was during a public consultation. <laughs> also in 2018, um, Helen's mentioned James Kirkup. He wrote a couple of pieces in The Spectator, which I read avidly, and became one of the first journalists, certainly the first men, to stand up for Women's Place UK in print. Um, he clearly saw and pointed out that there was something really odd going on when a bunch of socialist, feminist, trade unionists were being accused of being reactionary bigots. <laughs> Gabby Hinsliff also wrote a piece in The Guardian in May of that year. It was a feature that reported both sides uh, and the protests that were starting to happen outside feminist meetings. I'm just going to read a quote from that piece, which is about the feminists on the WPUK side. She wrote, They wanted to discuss the potential implications for women and girls of sharing single-sex spaces from domestic violence refuges and female prisons to swimming pool changing rooms and brownie packs with male-bodied people. 
and to explore what they see as the risk of predatory, non-trans men finding a way to abuse access to reach vulnerable women. They wanted to discuss bodies and biology without being told that mentioning vaginas excludes women who don't have them. And they suspected other women also had questions they weren't asking for fear of being called transphobic. And I've just read out that paragraph because when I saw it, I mean, it's from five years ago, and obviously a lot has happened in the last five years, but, in a, but that just struck me as quite an accurate summary of a lot of the concerns that just haven't really changed. Um, so in October, The Guardian was among the papers that ran editorials about the consultation before it closed. The paper took a cautious view, raised various issues, including prisons, and pointed out that the UK has a population many times the size of countries including Malta and Ireland that were continually being held up as role models. This prompted quite a strong reaction, and three Guardian US colleagues wrote a piece that set out why they and other colleagues disagreed with it. So I suppose what had happened um, by the end of 2018, that although the government was canvassing views on the plan to change the law, in some circles it was now seen as beyond the pale to question or disagree with the direction of travel that had been decided on by a Conservative government, albeit with, also with support from other parties. I think this made a lot of journalists pretty uncomfortable and inhibited, as it was obviously meant to. I'm not going to try and tell the story of the parallel campaigns for and against self-ID of the five years since and the way that they were covered in the press, but before I finish, I want to say two more things. Um, first is that 2019 and 2020 were when the concerns <coughs> about the Tavistock's gender identity service began to be registered much more strongly. The most dramatic story from a news point of view was the case brought by Kira Bell, uh, which was a judicial review um, about the treatment she'd received, the puberty blockers that she'd been given and which she re regretted being given. And she initially won um, in December 2020, and then that judgment was overturned in February 2021. But it had a big impact, both on the uh, service that the NHS was delivering and also on public awareness of the whole issue. Um, and while uh, journalists went on writing about it, a new element was the partnership of Deborah Cohen and Hannah Barnes on BBC Newsnight, who did a series of in-depth reports on the Tavistock. And the second thing I wanted to say that from a free speech point of view, which obviously has a huge impact on the press, I think the period between when Maya Forstutter lost her first employment tribunal case in December 2019 and won her appeal 18 months later <coughs> in June 2021. <laughs> I don't know if Maya's here, but I expect she might be. Um, but so that's your oh yes. So that's all of 2020 and half of 2021 I'm talking about was a really pretty awful time, I think, when it really wasn't at all clear that the courts were going to uphold the right to believe in, to talk about or write about the importance in life of biological sex and the sexual differences between male and female human beings. Uh, and that was obviously also the, the pandemic, which didn't make things any easier. And it was in that difficult period that Suzanne Moore who was then my colleague at The Guardian, wrote what I think were two brave and excellent columns from a gender-critical feminist viewpoint. Uh, and I was sorry then, and I still am, about what happened after that, which um, many people here will know about because she's written and spoken about it. I think it's a huge shame that we lost her at The Guardian. Her departure, followed by Hadley's, Hadley Freeman's, that is, left a gap where I think a columnist with gender-critical views ought to be. Uh, I don't think it will come as a surprise to anyone here or at my workplace that that's my view. Um, but we do have a columnist who um, has, uh, writes gender-critical pieces on our sister paper, The Observer, um, who is here tonight, and that's probably a good moment to hand over, although Susan's going to speak before her. Thank you.